Amen. Great to see everybody. Happy post-Easter Sunday. Amen. Welcome back for those of you who are joining us again. Uh, and uh, for the rest of us, it's great to see you. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, just say thank you to all of our teams that helped make our Easter weekend services uh, smashing success. So can we give a hand and thank all of our serve teams? Man, so grateful for all of you. Um, I don't know if you, many of you realize it, but we had four morning services here. We normally have three, so we added the one. And um, you may not know this, but all of our service here at the main campus, we had twice as many people last weekend than we normally do. So praise God. I know many of you invited guests and friends and family members, and they were here and uh, worshiping with us. And I, I just want to encourage you to continue to pray for them. Uh, if you invited someone and they're, they're not here, you know, continue to reach out to them, continue to love on them. Because the word that was sown, the Bible says, is like a seed. And when you plant a seed in the ground, it doesn't bear fruit immediately, amen? But it takes time. And so you got to continue to water that seed, cultivate that seed, and, and eventually the thing will come up. So continue to pray for your friends and loved ones. And if you are back for the second time after Easter, or maybe second or third time, welcome back. We're glad you're here. And uh, we pray you'll continue your journey of faith right here at Pearlside. We look forward to partnering along with you. And uh, along with that, I just want to say thank you to all of you for allowing our ushers to guide you into rows to sit. Thank you for smiling at them and cooperating with them. I know it's a, it's a new swing. You may not know this if you're new, but before COVID, we had to do that in all of our services because it was full. And then COVID, we kind of, you know, whatever, sit wherever you like. But now as God is bringing people back, we need to make sure that there's room. Amen. Because one of my greatest fears, call it a fear, is that you work so hard to bring your friend or your loved one to church and then they get stuck in some overflow sitting out in the lobby watching on a TV and they're like, man, I could have done this at home, you know. Um, and so I want to make sure that there's, there's space for everyone to experience the presence of God, hear the word of God, be comfortable in his presence. Amen. So thank you for cooperating in advance. Amen. All right. Anyway, uh, we are continuing our series, Blessed. And uh, we are, uh, when we began this series about a month ago, we said that the reason why we're in this series is we believe God wants to lead society to an awakening, a spiritual awakening and a revival once again. And one of the hallmarks of every historic revival is a, is a return and a resurgence in the church, first of all, of radical obedience, where we take God at his word seriously and we begin to live and obey his word. And so therefore, we say, man, we want to we look at what scripture teaches and how we can align our lives with his word, because when we align our lives with his word, we experience his blessing. And when we align our lives with his word, other people will see the goodness of God through us, which then brings about revival and transformation in society. And so we started this series a couple of months ago on that. And we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' famous teaching in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And we've been just kind of tracking through that because in it, Jesus is giving us the values of the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be a child of God? How does it mean, what does it mean to live as, as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, even while we live on this earth? And again, when we do, when we align ourselves with his word, his blessing comes. And we become, we are able to be a light to the world all around us. So that's where we are today. And we're continuing our conversation here in Matthew chapter 5. And in Matthew chapter 5, um, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, starting in verse 33. And we pick it up here. And he said this, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we invite your spirit to speak to us from your word, that we might understand your heart and what it means to live as children of God on this earth, that we might experience your blessing and be a blessing to other people around us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is Jesus talking about here? Well, if you remember from the beginning of our series, Jesus said, I do not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. See, oftentimes what, what, the, what the people in, in Jesus' day did is they, they, they wanted to abide by the letter of the law. What did it exactly say? And we're going to follow it exactly, right? And that's, I mean, that's a pretty good stand versus chucking it all together. But what Jesus wanted to get to is beyond just the letter of law, the spirit of the law, the heart of the law. So if you recall, we started off by talking about the, the verse that says, you know, you've heard it said, you shall not commit murder, right? How many of you think that's a good law, right? I, I like that. I don't want people committing murder. You know, we, do, we don't want that. But Jesus takes it a step further. The letter of, of the law says, do not commit murder. But I say to you, do not even be angry with someone without a cause, for you've already committed murder with 
in your heart. He takes it further, further than just, well, I didn't kill anybody. Yeah, but you got a lot of hatred. You got a lot of bitterness. You got a lot of anger in your heart. Let's deal with that. Because no one wakes up in the morning and says, you know, I'm going to murder somebody. No, it always started with hatred and anger in the heart that goes unresolved. You see, so Jesus wants to take it from beyond just, just, just outward obedience to an inward heart transformation. Right? He talks about, you've heard it said, not to commit adultery. And I think we would all agree that's a good, good rule to follow. But he said, don't even look at someone to lust after them who's not your spouse. He's taking it again from the surface level of behavior and bringing it down to the heart level. You see that? That's what he means when he says, I don't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. The fulfillment of the law is a transformed heart where, we, where, where we're different on the inside. So here we look at this passage and he says, you've heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely. Right? How many of you agree? We should not swear falsely. If we say something, we ought to do it. Right? But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or the earth, for it is his footstool. And he goes on to this whole thing. And he summarizes it. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than that comes from evil. What's he talking about? If you'd allow me to summarize here. It's like he's telling us, live with integrity. Live with integrity. Live in such a way that people take us at our word live with integrity. We shouldn't have to make oaths and promises and all these kinds of things. Be a person that lives with integrity. See, the way that this, this used to work in, in Jesus' day is, you know, everyone knew, okay, don't swear an oath to God and break that oath. Not only is that a sin because you swore to God, but number two, it's against the law, so you're going to be held liable. So for example, if I was going to sell you my house and I said, I, I swear there's nothing wrong with the house, I swear to God there is nothing wrong with the house. And then you find out later something's wrong with the house, now I'm liable not just to a court, but I'm also liable to God for that falsehood. You follow what I'm saying? Or if I, if I, if I sold to you my, my, my car and then, you know, I, I swear that there's nothing wrong with it. So you get, you get my point. We, we ought not to break that oath. But here's what Jesus is saying. It's, it goes even further than that. You shouldn't even have to swear on an oath because you're so trustworthy. You're a person that people know lives with integrity. That you don't need a contract. You don't need to swear on all these kinds of things because you are a person that lives with integrity. Now, why is that important? Well, if, as Christians, if we want people to take our gospel seriously about this Jesus that rose from the dead, well, then we need to be people that are trusted. Because if they don't trust us as people, they're not going to take our message seriously, right? And, if we, and, and, and we become a, a reproach on the gospel that we proclaim to preach. You know, I, I cite this study uh, every now and then, but there's a study that was done that showed that 85% of self-proclaiming atheists say that the primary reason for their non-belief is hypocrisy in the church, where Christians say one thing and do the exact opposite. We say we, we believe a certain thing, but then we live completely different. You get that? That duplicity is where people can't reconcile, and that's the reason for 85% of people's excuses why they don't want to believe in God. That's on us, amen, as Christians. If you're a Christian, that's on us. And so when Jesus says this, we need to live with integrity, that's part of the reason why he's talking about that. Because other people are going to look at our lives and say, well, you, you, you clearly don't even believe this. So why should I believe your gospel? And so there, there's, a, there's a fight here. There's a challenge here. Now, this isn't easy. To live with integrity, to let our yes be yes and our no be no is really hard. And none of us have done this perfectly. So I don't want you to sit here today and, and feel condemned because that's not the spirit of, of the gospel. But we should all feel challenged, amen? I don't know about you. I feel challenged when I read the Bible to say, all right, I want to get this right. And God, I need your help because I can't do this on my own. Can I hear an amen to that? But this is so important to Jesus. He puts it here. And, and you know, and, and the, inter the, the thing about the, the, the Jews in this, in this day and age is they had so many loopholes. So here's what they did. They knew that if we swear to God, we're going to be held liable. So they created this whole layer of different oaths that you could take. So, for example, if you swore to the temple, like I, if I'm selling you my car, I swear to the temple of God that there's nothing wrong with this car. I could break that oath and not be held liable. I could even swear to the altar in the temple, and I could break that oath and not be held liable. There were all these different levels and loopholes that they created. And Jesus is saying, look, stop using these loopholes to manipulate people. Stop using all of these things. Just, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. I'll give you an example. I, uh, uh, several years ago, I, I, I sold my, my old cell phone because, you know, whenever I upgrade my phone, I always will sell it, you know, sell the old one so I can pay for the new one. Anyway, and so it was an iPhone 11. This tells you how long ago this was. And... Um, so I listed it on Craigslist, and I, and I wrote, you know, like, you know, like new condition, you know. And, uh, and, and this is the phrase I used, no visible scratches. 
because the scratch on it was not visible. See, I had put a screen protector on it, and you couldn't see the scratch on the screen because there was a screen protector on it. Technically, I wasn't lying because the scratch wasn't visible when deep down I knew that there was a scratch on that screen. Now, to be fair, it was a very thin scratch, and you'd have to look at it in a perfect you know, lighting, but it was there. But I put no visible scratches on the screen. And here's, here's how, what I told myself. I said, I'm not lying. Technically, technically, it's not visible. But deep down, I knew it was there. The spirit of what I was saying was I was being duplicitous. You see that? I wasn't being honest in that. So I, I posted it, and I was like, well, technically, I'm not lying. Technically, it's not against the law. Technically, if anybody finds out, I'll just say, oh, I didn't see it there. Technically, I'm not, I'm not going to be held in any trouble, so I'm good, right? Because here's what I knew. I knew if I said that there was a scratch on the screen, it would devalue the phone probably by about 100 bucks. I want that 100 bucks because I got to pay for the new phone that I bought, right? So I'm talking myself into why I'm not lying right now. But by your awkwardness and your giggling, you know how I should feel about that. <laughs> Somebody messaged me, said, oh, so, so there's no scratches on the phone. I said, oh. <laughs> there are no visible scratches on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I felt so convicted. The Holy Spirit convicted me. He said, you know what you're doing right now. You know you're being deceitful. And this is what, this is what I felt God tell me. For $100, you're going to compromise your integrity so that you can get 100 bucks. Is that all your integrity is worth to you? Really? $100? I was so convicted. So I replied. So I replied. It took me about a day. Let me be honest. Okay, I wasn't like, yeah, I'm going to be super honest. I took about a day. I was just wrestling with this. Maybe someone else will message me and then not ask me questions so I don't have to lie, you know. Or, so anyway, so finally I, was, I ended up messaging this person. I didn't know who it was at the time. I messaged them back. I said, actually, there's a very thin scratch on the screen. I'll show it to you. But with the screen protector on, you can't see it, but I'll show it to you when we meet up. She said, okay. So we met up. And so I showed her the scratch on the screen, and this is what she said. Oh, it's not that bad. I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> Long story short, she bought it for the price that I wanted. I got the money that I, that, I, that I wanted to get for the phone. But more importantly, I walked out of that going, I almost sold out my integrity for $100. Really? Is that all that that's worth to you? But here's what was going on through my mind. I need that money. You know, I'm not rich, you know, and, and I can buy stuff. I got to take care of my kids. And, all this kind of, and we, we justify why it's okay when in reality that's not an honest response. I could stand before the Lord and say, well, technically I didn't lie. And God would be like, yeah, but you knew what you were doing. If she caught me somehow, technically I didn't lie to you, but in my heart there was deceit. That's what Jesus is after. That's what he's talking about here. Don't swear at all. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't create some loophole that you can get out and, and, and weasel your way out and say, well, you know, technically I didn't do anything. No, no, no. What was going on in your heart? That's always what Jesus is after. Right? Again, going back to the whole adultery thing. Hey, let's talk about the heart. Talk about the whole, I didn't kill that person. Yeah, but your heart, you hate them and you want them to die. Yeah, but you didn't kill them, but it's in your heart. That's what Jesus is always after. That's what he's talking about here. In our heart, there's deceit. In our heart, there's deceptiveness. And Jesus says, you got to deal with that. You got to deal with that. What is that area for you? Or maybe you're saying, you know, it's not technically wrong. It's not technically bad. But in your heart, you know you're being deceptive. And we'd love to come right up to the line of sin and be like, well, technically, you know, and here's what God's saying, no, get as far away from that line as possible. Don't use a technicality to get what you want. Be an honest person because at the end of the day, that's the person that God blesses, amen? Be an honest person because at the end of the day, that's the person that God blesses. And that's the people that when people look at you, they will either see Jesus or they'll see deceitfulness. And they won't see the heart of Jesus Christ. You know, they say that, you know, people come to faith. Before, another study was done that showed that when people come to faith, they have to first trust a Christian in their life. Uh, there was a study that was done. They studied over 2,000 uh, former non-believers who became Christians, and they, they found that the, it, there was a pattern. All of them came to trust a, a believer in their life. You might be, we, I, we all might be the only Christian in somebody's life. And if they don't trust us, how are they ever going to come to faith in Jesus? They don't trust us. They won't trust our message. Amen. So we got to come as far away from the line as possible, be as upfront and honest as possible, not use technicalities to get out. And that's what Jesus was addressing here in this text. You all have all these layers of oaths. Just let your yes be yes and no be no. Anything more than that, you're trying to manipulate, you're trying to control, you're trying to use a technicality to get out of stuff, and it's wrong. It's evil. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Furthermore, we ought to live lives that our word is enough because people trust us. And I know that's easier said than done. But what is that area of your life right now where we feel, where we're tested and it's hard to be honest. It's hard to be 
right. It's hard to, hard to live in a way that people trust us. It's more important than ever because we live in a world where, where we, we don't even know if we can trust the media, right? There's fake news. Now there's AI that's putting stuff on the internet that we don't even know what's real with images and the Pope wearing a puffer jacket. I'm just like, what is going on in the world? And you don't know what I'm talking about. That's okay. But it's just, it, it, you know, there's all kinds of fake stuff out there that we don't know what's real anymore. And all the more people are going to be looking for the people in their lives. Are you real? They're going to try to poke at you and see, are you real? Do you really believe this? And if, if we are, then they're going to go, then I'll take your message seriously. That's why Jesus is making such a big deal about this. We can, we can shine a light in this dark world if we choose to fight for integrity. And it is a fight. Why don't we live with integrity? I, I had a couple of thoughts on this. Three things. Number one, why don't we live with integrity? Why is this so hard? It's because we live in the flesh. We live in the flesh. Louis Galatians 6 says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man or a woman reaps what he or she sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. What's he talking about? There's a war and a battle going on at all times within us between the flesh and the Spirit. What is the flesh? The flesh is of obviously this body and the things that we live in, but, but more so it's our desires. It's our passions. It's our pleasures. And that is always warring on in the inside of us to get what we want and satisfy our cravings and to, to get more for ourselves. When I was tempted to lie about the phone scratch, because in my mind, I knew I would lose $100, which could go to feeding my pleasures. I could buy those shoes that I want or that jacket that I want or go to eat at that restaurant that I want. And it, it was my flesh that made me want to do that. And in all of our lives, when we live in the flesh, we're going to be more and more tempted to, to give in and to compromise the right thing, the harder thing, right? And all of us live in the flesh. And what the Bible says is we, we make it a habit of living in the flesh and satisfying our flesh, we will reap this destruction in our lives. If you want to hear more about this, we talked about this actually two weeks ago in our sermon, so I won't spend too much time here, but, but there's a battle going on. It's a battle to do the right thing. It's hard. And none of us, again, have done this perfectly. And we need to come before the Holy Spirit, come before the Lord and say, God, I need your help to do this. I need your help. When I'm tempted to be dishonest, when I'm tempted to cheat or lie or steal or whatever it is, I need your help in this moment. Um, hopefully you all did your taxes. Everybody do your taxes because uh, tax time's coming up, huh? Uh, yeah, so I'm nervous <clears throat> on the other side there. All right. Um, so I, I did my taxes this past week and I realized just how, how tempting it is to fudge on things and to, to cheat. So I use TurboTax. I don't know if this is not an advertisement. I don't get anything else, but I use TurboTax. And I don't know if you've ever used those tax software, but you plug in all your numbers, and it shows you at the top how much you have to either have to pay in taxes or how much you're going to get back, right? Have you ever tried to just kind of change numbers here and there and just to see what happens? <laughs> Dude, I spent like all afternoon the other day. Well, if, I, if this was happening and I had this, da, 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 and you see the number change, ooh. And now it's green, and I'm going to get me a refund. Oh, if I change a little bit here, oh, look at that. It's even more green, and now I'm going to get $1,000 back or whatever, right? And, and so, so every year we, we take, you know, some of our old stuff to Goodwill. And, you know, if you ever donated to Goodwill, they give you those receipts, right? And have you ever noticed that no one really verifies what you gave? So you drop off five boxes. They don't know if it's five boxes of underwear or five boxes of diamonds. Like, no one knows. Like, you just drop off this box, and they give you a receipt. So I plugged in, and then now you can calculate kind of what you donated. So, I, you know, jeans, socks, all this kind of stuff. And you get a little bit of a tax return just for fun. I, I, pl I plugged in that I donated, like, some expensive electric e equipment and <laughs> gold bars. And then you just see the number, like, turn green. You're like, whoa. It's so tempting to satisfy my flesh. How would they know? They're not going to go back in time and open up the bags that I gave them, you know, years, you know, early in January of last year and verify, oh, there weren't gold bars in there. What are you doing? Like, you know, no one's going to know that. No one would know. God would know. Amen. But in my flesh, I'm going, oh, man, I could sure use an extra $1,500 in my tax returns. Man, I could sure use that to fix, what, you know, my roof or my water heater or whatever it is or just to feed my flesh. But if we're not careful living in, by the way, I didn't do that. I deleted the gold bars and all that. And I just, and it went back down. I was like, oh, man, it's depressed. Anyway, um, but, if we, but if we stay in that place in the flesh and we don't pause to go, God, what, what is the right thing to do in this moment? It's so tempting. And there are so many of those opportunities in our lives everywhere we are that if we're not careful and we're just living to feed our flesh, we're going to find ourselves very far away from the will of God. And very far away from the blessing of God. And we're going to become people that people, they, they don't trust us. Because even though 
right now no one knows, eventually it, it, it comes out and we become, rather than a sign to the goodness of Jesus, we become a tarnish to the message of Jesus Christ. And the world tells you just live for your flesh, satisfy your flesh. But here, like we said before, the scripture tells us deny your flesh, die to yourself to do what's right. And it may hurt in the moment, but at the end of the day, God is, a pers- God is the one who blesses. We li- why don't we live with integrity? Number one, we live in the flesh. Number two, we don't trust God. We don't trust God, right? Why, why would we compromise? Why would we sin? Why would we do this? Oftentimes, it's because we don't ultimately trust in God. Look what Proverbs 3 says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. In all of them, submit to him. And he will make your paths straight. So when I was playing with the tax numbers, I, I was like, man, I could use that $1,500 tax credit or whatever. I could use that refund to do all the things that I need to do. And, and here's the reality. If there's no God who will hold me accountable, if there is no God who is our provider, then why not do it? If you can get away with it, why not? That's what the world says, right? Why not do it? But at the end of the day, I go, God, no, you are my provider. You are the one who will ultimately look after me. I just got to do the right thing. And many times we compromise because we don't actually trust that God is in heaven and that he blesses and he rewards a life of faithfulness. At the end of the day, that's often what comes down. And so we, have, we feel like I have to compromise. Otherwise, who's going to look out for me? I have to do this. Otherwise, what, what am I going to have? If we trust God, we go, no, I don't have to do that. I can choose to do the right thing and trust that God will come through for me to give me what I need when I need it. But sometimes we, we compromise because we don't trust God. And then thirdly, and this is probably the biggest one. We forget that we're accountable to God. Why, why don't we live with integrity? We forget that we're gonna, we are accountable to God. Look at what 2 Corinthians tells us. For we must all. Everybody say all. You know what all means in the Greek? All. Yeah. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Every single one of us. Every single one of us are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad bad now this should be a startling reminder to us we're going to stand before God and be accountable for how we lived how we treated people maybe that girl would have never found out about the scratch under the screen because you couldn't see it under the screen protector and maybe she keeps that on for the her whole life and never sees the scratch I'm still going to stand before the Lord for how I deceived that person for my own selfish gain maybe the IRS will never find out about the gold bars that I gave to Goodwill and got a tax credit for, right? Maybe no one will ever find out about that. God knows about it, and he will hold me accountable for my deceptiveness and my deceitfulness. You see, we got to remember that. We're accountable to a God who sees everything, and that shouldn't cause us fear. It's, 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 it's accountability to help us to do what we know is the right thing to do anyway. What is that area of your life today where you're tested in these areas, and you need to be reminded to not live in the flesh, to trust God and, to, and not forget that we are accountable to God. Because how can we live with integrity? It's just that simple. Deny the flesh, trust God, and remember that you're accountable to him. And as we remember these things and we keep these things ever present before our lives, we're going to be more positioned to do the right thing more often than not. As difficult as that is. But we have to fight against a culture that says, why not? You can get away with it. Everybody does it. By the way, if everyone does something, that should be a sign to us that there's probably something wrong with it. Because Jesus reminds us that narrow is the path that leads to life. Wide is the road that leads to destruction, and many travel down that road. If everyone's doing something, that should be a sign to us. Well, maybe it's not the right thing to do. Maybe I should think about that. Maybe I should look at that. But when we deny the flesh, trust God, and remember that we're accountable to him, we can be people that reflect God's goodness on this earth, which ultimately is the goal. We shouldn't do this just because we want blessing from God. We should do this so that we can be a testimony to other people about his goodness and his love as well. How many of us know this is what the world needs now more than anything else? The world needs to see the church of Jesus Christ take him and his word so seriously that we're willing to even lose in the short term to do the right thing. And listen, that's hard. I wish I could tell you I always did that perfectly. I didn't. But together, as we submit ourselves to the word, we can be a people that shine the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite examples of this is a guy by the name of Glenn James. And I share this story every several years, if nothing else, just to remind myself that this is how we ought to live. But Glenn James' story poses us this question. What would you do if you found a bag on the street that had a lot of money in it, just left on the ground? What would you do with that? 
Would you say, praise the Lord, God is blessing me today? Or would you try to return it to its rightful owner? What would you do if there was $40,000 to be exact found in that bag? What would you do if you were a homeless person and desperate for money and found that amount of money in a bag? Well, Glenn James shows us, I think, an example of how we can trust God and do the right thing and how God loves to show up as a result. Take a look at Glenn James' story. An update this morning on a homeless man who captured the nation's admiration. He found and then returned a backpack containing tens of thousands of dollars. As Michelle Miller shows us, that good deed is leading to an even bigger payout. 54-year-old Glenn James doesn't say much. He lets his actions do the talking. Good. Very, very good. <laughs> On Saturday, James, who has been homeless for the past five years, found a bag accidentally left in front of this TJ Maxx store. Inside was $2,400 cash and $39,000 in traveler's checks. A sizable amount for someone who survives on food stamps and spare change. But instead of keeping the money for himself, James turned it in to police, who then returned it to its rightful owner. We have a plaque here that we'd like to give you. On Monday, the Boston Police Department paid tribute to his good deed. I just want to thank Mr. James for what he did. And it really is a, a remarkable uh, tribute to him. And, uh, and his honesty. But James' honesty is now paying off more than he could have ever expected. His story has attracted national attention, moving strangers to action. No more? Ethan Whittington from Virginia set up an account in James's name on the crowdfunding site GoFundMe. Donations have poured in from across the country and in just two days are closing in on $100,000. Glenn being in the situation he's in, it shows that there's still uh, some humanity in the world. James, who is a serious speech impediment, didn't have much to say, but released a handwritten letter explaining why he returned the money. He wrote, even if I were desperate for money, I would not have kept even a penny of the money I found. I'm extremely religious. God is always very well looked after me. For CBS This Morning, Michelle Miller, New York. I just love that story because it just shows, you know, what, what God can do. And by the way, to date, I just looked it up this morning. The Go, GoFundMe has raised $165,502 to be exact for Glenn James. More than four times what he gave back. And, you know, I, again, I think about that. I go, well, I would have maybe kept the cash, give the traveler's checks back, you know, because the finder's fee, right? And I can't cash those anyway, Right. And you'd be like, I'm doing the right thing. That's a good thing. No, no, no. See, God, tr God says, look, look, I see what you, I see what you do. I see, and, and I can bless in a moment. That amount of money, $165,000, changed Glenn James' life. And they, they're, the guy who started the GoFundMe met up with him and was able to help him. And if trust was actually set up to help him get back on his feet, to get him a place to stay and a job and all that kind of thing. And I just think about that. In a moment, if we're faithful, God can turn our situations around. Amen. I don't, think, I don't think Glenn thought for a moment that would happen. He just wanted to do the right thing, knowing that God always takes care of me. Look at that. And he did. What about us? See, I think God is watching all of our lives from heaven, and he's going, are you a person that I can trust with blessing, greater positions of authority, greater this, greater that? And he allows these opportunities as tests to see how are we going to respond. How we respond very often determines how God responds back to us. But what is that area in our lives today where we're tested, where we're tempted to not do the right thing, to not be completely honest, to cover, to hide, to use a loophole, to get around stuff? That might be the test where God is saying, I want you to win here. Do the right thing. It may be hard. You may lose out in the short term. But in a moment, God can turn things around in our lives. And Glenn James' story, I think, tells us that. How do we, how do we live a life of integrity? Again, deny the flesh. Trust God like Glenn James did. And then thirdly, remember that we're accountable to God. <clears throat> I remember when I was in high school coming to church here, I uh, heard the story of a couple in our church who were business owners. And they had just started a business at the time, young business owners. And um, one of the things that small businesses often do, I'm told, I don't know personally, but I'm told is they pay their employees under the table. Now, I know that's a common practice. And if you're in business and you do that, you know, it's between you and the Lord. But you know, you pay your employees under the table. Why? Because you save on taxes. You don't have to pay payroll costs and all kinds of other things and all that. And anyway, this, 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 this young couple who owns a business did that. 
And as they grew in their faith in Jesus, they realized, you know what? No, we got to do things the right way. We don't want to do things under the table. We want to be above board, everything, you know, documented and in the right because we want to honor God with our business. That's what they said. I remember they shared their testimony uh, when we were back up at Momilani. And I remember one of the things that they said was, this might hurt us because we're going we're gonna to lose money and we're not going to be able to compete with some of the other people in our industry, but we're going to do the right thing. And I remember sitting there going, I don't know if I'll do that, you know. <laughs> That's tough, man. I mean, you know, you want to. But you know what happened? God blessed their business. And it grew tremendously. And over the last 20 years, their business multiplied many, many times over. And even during the pandemic, their business thrived when others were falling apart and shutting down. And I go back to years and years ago when they decided we're going to honor God with our business and do the right thing. And, you know, their story helped me when I was going through college and tempted to compromise in a different way, shape, and form. No, no, no. Do the right thing because God sees and God blesses those he can trust. Amen. Furthermore, you become a light where your employees know you're doing the right thing. There are other people know you're doing the right thing. Hey, we become a witness to the gospel. What is that area for us this morning? Where we're tempted to compromise. Or maybe we've been compromising. Again, no condemnation. But the Holy Spirit loves to convict us. Loves to convict us so that we adjust our lives to his word rather than the world so we can experience his blessing and be a blessing to the world all around us. What is that place right now in your life? The Holy Spirit may be shining his light in different areas. That's a good thing. So we can say, Lord, I need your help here. Because all of us struggle. Every single one of us do. But when we align our lives with his word, we can experience his blessing. And again, be a blessing to the world all around us. And I close with this. As we walk with integrity, we can have greater fellowship with Jesus and experience his freedom. We can have greater fellowship with Jesus and experience his freedom. Look at what 1 John says. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. God is holy. There is no darkness in him. And if we allow darkness to persist in our lives for whatever reason, that's going to put a lid on our relationship with God. It's going to hinder our relationship with God. But when we allow the light in, as hard as it may be to return the money, to do the right thing, to stop paying people under the table, to be honest in our dealings or in our taxes or in our relationships, whatever it is, we're allowing the light of Jesus in. And we can have greater fellowship with him. Here's the good news, though. In the areas where we struggle, because we all will, none of us done this perfectly, we have a God who says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. What is that area for us? Because God wants to make us a, the people that our unsaved friends and family members say you're a person of integrity. The sad thing is, is when Christians are less trusted than others, we got to turn that around. Amen. And in our society, people don't trust the church. They don't trust Christians because of all kinds of different reasons, which I won't get into. But you and I have the opportunity to turn that around in our homes, in our workplaces, with our friends, and begin to start a revolution of love where people see the goodness of God in us. It's going to be hard. Be hard. It's going to be a sacrifice, but it's worth it in the end. Amen? Because our Heavenly Father's watching, and He loves to bless His kids when He knows that He can trust us. Amen? Will you bow your heads with me as we come to a close? Father, thank You for Your Word that challenges us, challenges our values, challenges what we think is right. Thank You for Your Word that shows us the darkness in our own souls not to make us feel bad but so that we can turn from that and so that we can allow your spirit to change us help us to be men and women that when our friends look at us they see something different they see the goodness and the kindness and the honesty when we say we're going to do something we do it when we say we're going to be somewhere we're there when we say something it's our word and it's as good as an oath that we don't even need to take god help us to be that kind of people can't do this without you. We need your help. So fill us with your spirit to empower us to live this out in, your, in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name.